who are members of the Peabody Institute Advisory Board, distinguished guests, faculty, staff, and alumni of the Peabody Institute, and of course, members of the graduating class of the Peabody Conservatory. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the Peabody Conservatory's 136th graduation exercises, which are part of the commencement exercises closing the Johns Hopkins University's 142nd academic year. I want to offer my heartiest congratulations to each and every one of our graduates here today. I'm also delighted to see so many parents, relatives, and friends here to celebrate with you our graduating students. I know that your families have shared in every challenge and every success that you've experienced throughout your time here at Peabody. You could not have achieved that which we celebrate today without their counsel and support. To the families of our graduates, we say thank you. I also want to recognize and thank our truly outstanding faculty for the critical and guiding role they have played in bringing you, our students, to this point today. We owe you a debt of gratitude for your great commitment to our students. It's now my honor to invite the Provost of the Johns Hopkins University, Dr. Sunil Kumar, to the podium to offer a greeting on behalf of the university. Provost Kumar. Thank you, Dean Bronstein. Good morning, everyone, and welcome Peabody class of 2018. It is a great honor to be here today with our graduates and our loved ones. I'm doubly honored to be among the first to graduate, uh, to congratulate the graduating class of 2018. I think they deserve one more round of applause for an exceptionally and <laughs> I think they deserve that hand for an exceptionally demanding and hopefully rewarding job well done. Today's graduates know as well as anyone that Peabody and Johns Hopkins require a great deal from their students. They have probably been times during the course of your studies when some of you thought too much was expected. But you persevered, you accomplished the difficult, and in some cases, the seemingly impossible. And that's as it should be, That says it needs to be with people as talented and determined as you. This is a special day, one you likely won't forget. I believe that such special days, marked by high ceremony, are days to celebrate achievement, set aspiration, and reaffirm responsibilities. I've already congratulated you for your perseverance through a challenging program. Let me also congratulate you for choosing a career in music. More importantly, let me thank you for doing so. I see you as indispensable to the world and to America. Today is a day for you to set your personal aspiration. Here I would like to use the words of Daniel Coit Gilman, the first president of Johns Hopkins, in his inaugural address on February 22, 1876. Neither Peabody nor the world is what it was then, but his words ring true nonetheless. He says, remote utility is quite as worthy to be thought of as immediate advantage. Those ventures are not always the most sagacious that expect a return on the morrow. It sometimes pays to send our argosies across the seas to make investments with an eye to slow but sure returns. In setting your aspiration, I encourage you to think of the long term, and not just the returns to you, but the returns to society. It won't be enough for you to do well. You must do good. To quote Gilman again, the object of the university is to develop character. It misses its aim if it produced learned, learned pedants or simple artisans or cunning sophists, or pretentious practitioners. Its purport is not so much to impart knowledge 
to the pupils as to whet the appetite, exhibit methods, develop powers, strengthen judgment, and invigorate the intellectual and moral forces. It should prepare for the service of society a class of students who will be wise, thoughtful, progressive guides in whatever department of work or thought they may be engaged. We, as a society, need you to create what is currently inconceivable, to discover what has proven stubbornly undiscovered, and to reach the previously unreachable in your art and your life. In his State of the Union address in 1963, John F. Kennedy said, this country cannot afford to be materially rich and spiritually poor. I believe the statement is true of the world at large. And people like you are necessary if we are to rise from our current poverty of spirit and culture. To be Gilman's guides for society is your primary responsibility. But my list of responsibilities for you has not ended. In the eyes of the world, you are the Peabody Conservatory and the Johns Hopkins University. The average citizen is more likely to meet one of you than one of our faculty. So represent us well. As you choose your careers and your paths through society, be, be sure to choose wisely so that you may find your future to be both consequential and rewarding. And may you have the wisdom to know what is both consequential and rewarding to you. I also remind you that you are part of the Johns Hopkins family now and forever. And there is, and there is much to be had by staying in touch. You never know how you may benefit from the relationship in the future, or more importantly, how you might be able to contribute in a way that makes possible for someone else to achieve what you're celebrating today. I realize that I've asked a great deal of you without proffering much in return. Let me bestow upon you a secular benediction. In Sanskrit, Saraswati, the goddess of art and knowledge, is described as Varade Kamarupini, a grantor of wishes who takes any desired form. Here's my benediction to you. May your art be amenable to your wishes and take the form that you wish it to. And may it grant you your every wish. What else is there to say but congratulations again? I wish you nothing but success in all your future endeavors. Make Peabody and Johns Hopkins proud. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Provost Kumar. Class of 2018, I'll have some thoughts that I do want to share with you a little later in our program. But most importantly, we are here today to honor you with the awarding of diplomas. Just as we have contributed to your development as musicians, teachers, and scholars, so have you contributed richly to the quality of musical and intellectual life here at Peabody. We appreciate your entrusting to us the development of your individual gifts during your time here, and we wish for you all a lifetime full of opportunities to now go out and share those gifts with others. Now, you all know that more than anything else, we are about music. So to spotlight all of your many musical accomplishments, we've invited two members of your graduating class to perform at this ceremony. We're honored to present these farewell performances as representative of the class of 2018. Please welcome the first of our performers and your colleagues now.
Good morning, everyone. Are you all excited? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> First of all, congratulations to all of you on this achievement of all your hard work. And of course, thank you to the parents, family, friends, teachers, mentors, and all of the administrators for getting them here. My name is Elizabeth Berman. I'm the president of the Society of Peabody Alumni. I've seen a lot of your faces on campus for a lot of our different events that we've done in the last couple of years. And I am thrilled to personally give you my congratulations on a job well done, and I hope you're just as excited. <laughs> I also extend my welcome to each of you into an extraordinary, vibrant network of alumni, not just of Peabody, but as Provost Kumar said, but of the Johns Hopkins University. I couldn't also be more pleased to be present as Clinton Adams, one of my favorite teachers, receives his award in X for Excellence Woo! Teaching. <laughs> I am an alumna of both Peabody. <laughs> See, I'm all emotional because he was one of my favorite teachers. <laughs> I'm an alum of Peabody in Oboe Performance and of the Zanville Krieger School of Arts and Sciences up at Homewood in Romance Languages. My path to this stage today began with my mom moving to Baltimore from semi-rural Mississippi, where I was born, to complete her DMA in Peabody. And I got to watch her walk across this stage, sitting back here where these guys are. <laughs> I came to Peabody and didn't know that Peabody would be in my future, but I built the foundation for the person I am today. I built a great network of friends, wonderful colleagues, amazing musicians, like the one we just heard, <laughs> and I also met my husband. After years of music making and instruction, nonprofit arts administration became my calling, and I actually worked just seven blocks south at Chesapeake Shakespeare Company down in the harbor. The biggest lesson I have learned over the last decade is that life happens. Don't expect things to go exactly as planned or that things will fall into your lap. Go out and create opportunities, not just for yourself, but for your colleagues, your family, your communities. Use the networking tools available to you of both alumni associations, not just Peabody, but also of Hopkins, to open doors for others and in return have doors open for you. The best way to do this, of course, is to stay connected. Our fellow Hopkins alumni, more than 215,000 individuals from nine schools with hundreds of different specialties. They are, are, they are a diverse group that represent all walks of life from across the country and around the world. Stick a pin in the Peabody alumni map and let us know what you're doing and where you are. And go hop online where you can network with current students and alumni across the divisions. Remember, Peabody and Hopkins are now a part of who you are. Hopefully you had as fulfilling an experience as I did when I, when I was here. But now consider how you might return that favor to the thousands of students that will follow you. We always want to hear from you, and we will always thank you for your time, your treasure, and your talent. Keep in touch. Congratulations, everyone. Good morning and congratulations, graduates. I am pleased to call special attention to all of the students who have received prizes or awards for specific achievements. Their names are listed in the program, those who are graduating today, as well as those who are not. On behalf of the conservatory, I thank the many friends of Peabody whose donations have made these awards possible. I now ask that all those students, both on stage and in the hall, to stand at their places so that we might applaud them for their accomplishments. Thank you. Of necessity, the names of the recipients of three of the prizes listed could not be included in the program because the recipients of those prizes could not be selected until after all of the grades had been submitted. They are the recipients of the Azalea H. Thomas Prizes and the Peabody Alumni Award. I ask the following students to come forward when their names are called. The, the Azalea H. Thomas Prizes 
are awarded to the instrumentalist and the vocalist who graduate with the highest grade point average in music theory earned throughout the bachelor degree program. This year, we have a three-way tie. <laughs> Each of these students earned the same GPA in music theory throughout their programs, specifically a 4.0, so the prize will be shared equally among them. The Azalea H. Thomas Prize for Instrumentalists is awarded to Christopher Frick, Bronwyn Cure, and Flavia Pajajo von der Stadt. This year's Azalea H. Thomas Prize to the vocalist with the highest grade point average in music theory earned throughout the bachelor degree program is awarded to Mercy Calhoun. was established by the Peabody Alumni Association and is annually awarded to the graduating student who attains the highest grade point average for the entire bachelor degree program. This year, with a grade point average of 3.98, the Peabody Alumni Award is given to Christopher Frick. <laughs> This is the one we all love, and I may choke up as well, so please bear with me as we get through this. The Excellence in Teaching Award was established in 1992 through the generosity of the Johns Hopkins University Alumni Association as a way in which each of the divisions of the university can annually recognize the extraordinary dedication and accomplishment, uh, sorry, accomplishments of at least one of our many fine teachers. It is my pleasure at this time to assist Mr. Brian McMillan Secretary of the Johns Hopkins University Alumni Association in presenting this year's Excellence in Teaching Award. Clinton Adams, as a member of the music theory faculty and teacher of ear training for the Peabody Conservatory since 1983, you have touched the lives of countless students through engaging, energetic, humorous, and professional manner. You are widely admired as a teacher of enormous dedication with a keen sense of humor and a passionate devotion to your students and to the art of music. Time and again over the decades, you have demonstrated your deep personal investment in students, giving generously of your time to those needing extra help with classwork, and providing support and motivation to all who come through your courses. Students credit your teaching with opening up their ears to the beauty and genius of great music. You push them to be better musicians, while sharing of yourself and showing compassion and understanding for the struggles and challenges in their lives. On a daily basis, you put your students first, you inspire them to excel, and you make them laugh. An accomplished pianist acclaimed for your elegant, sensitive, colorful, and meticulous playing, you have performed as a soloist and collaborative artist throughout North and South America, Europe, and Africa, winning numerous awards and competitions and recording for the Summit and Leonardo labels. Colleagues speak admirably of your talent, commitment, and intelligence as a performer. Your course on the well-tempered clavier of J.S. Bach, which you teach from the piano by memory, is a legendary example of your total command of teaching. 
In regularly accompanying many of your students in recitals and studio classes, you combine your performance expertise with your continued interest in the development and growth of students, setting an example they remember, value, and emulate long after graduation. Your accomplishments, authenticity, and high standards for all make you a hero and a role model in this community. Your many years of service and unfailing good humor make you something of an institution here. And your caring demeanor and warm and generous heart make you a beloved teacher, mentor, colleague, and friend. Clinton Adams, in recognition of your many gifts and accomplishments and with our profound gratitude for all that you are and the good that you do, it is our pleasure to present to you the Johns Hopkins University Alumni Association's Excellence in Teaching Award for 2018. Albert Schweitzer once observed, there are two means of refuge from human misery, music and cats. <laughs> I would expand that to include all the wonderful creatures that nature has bestowed on our planet. As a matter of fact, a pet python named Julius Squeezer <laughs> taught me far more about scales than anyone really needs to know. <laughs> For 52 years, the last 35 of them at Peabody, helping music students develop into world-class musicians has, in turn, helped me to be a better musician and teacher. I have always preferred to be behind the scenes in helping people, a collaborator, a companist, if you will, aiding and abetting, but never colluding definitely no collusion ever. <laughs> Whether it was playing the orchestra part on a second piano in Avery Fisher Hall to help Awadajan Pratt win the Naumburg competition in 1991, uh, the many recitals and competitions, I played with Zul Bailey and uh, many other students all over the world, or helping Hilary Hahn learn the Schoenberg Concerto a piece that I had long regarded as far more Baird than Schoen, <laughs> until I spent a summer helping her to learn it. The list is very long and includes every student that has ever graced one of my classes. Music is a lifeline that was freely thrown to me at a very early age at the first orchestral concert that I attended at the age of seven. The featured work on that program was the Brahms D minor piano concerto. And in the course of the performance of that piece, I accepted Johannes Brahms as my personal lord and savior, <laughs> and music as my newfound religion. Over many years of study, I've added gods and idols until now, when my musical pantheon includes composers alphabetically from John Adams to Judith Lang Zaymont, and chronologically, from Hildegard of Bingen to Judith Lang Zaymont. <laughs> Through performing and teaching, I've tried to pass the lifeline that was thrown so freely and generously to me onto others. I would be remiss if I did not recognize the tremendous amount of help that I get from those who assist me on a daily basis. Jacques-Pierre Malan, a superb cellist, who has lived in my house and helped enormously since I became disabled five years ago, the parking garage attendants, who always ensure a space for my special needs vehicle, the maintenance staff who make sure that my teaching space is clean and safe, the cafeteria staff who haven't poisoned me yet, <laughs> my brilliant and inspiring colleagues 
all of whom deserve excellence in teaching awards, in my humble but accurate opinion. <laughs> and of course, uh, most obviously, the most excellent students. I am thrilled, delighted, honored, and humbled by the recognition shown me today, and I have every intention of continuing as long as I am able. Thank you very much. So while we are giving out awards, um, I think I have a citation I'm going to uh, read about the recipient of our, of our Peabody Medal this year. But suffice it to say that, as you'll hear, this is a, an artist who has won virtually every award you can win in our field. And um, it seemed high time after 60 years, that he would be receiving the Peabody Medal. So I'll read the citation. Leon Fleischer, you've spent a lifetime at the highest echelons of classical music, recognized as a consummate musician whose career is a testament to the life-affirming power of art. A child prodigy, you began to study the piano at the age of four. By the time you were nine, the legendary Arthur Schnabel invited you to be his student, first in Lake Como, Italy, and then in New York, where you evolved into one of the great music masters of our time. You made your debut with the New York Philharmonic, conducted by Pierre Monteur, when you were just 16 years old. Maestro Monteur called you the pianistic find of the century. You went on to international renown, becoming the first American to win the prestigious Queen Elizabeth of Belgium competition in Brussels in 1952. Your interpretations of the piano concerti of Brahms and Beethoven are of particular renown, and your recordings, most notably with George Zell and the Cleveland Orchestra, are recognized as among the great collaborations in the concerto repertoire. At the height of your success, just before a scheduled tour of Russia with the Cleveland Orchestra, you began to suffer symptoms of focal dystonia in your right hand. The loss of the use of your hand led you to channel your creativity in new directions, mastering the piano repertoire for left hand, and initiating a career in conducting. Your historic performances of Paul Hindemith's Clavier Musique include its world premiere with the Berlin Philharmonic and its American premiere with the San Francisco Symphony. Your performances as a conductor are hailed for the same passion and poetry that made you a legendary pianist. Since 1959, you have offered inspiration, guidance, and insight to hundreds of students at the Peabody Conservatory, where you currently hold the Andrew W. Mellon Chair in piano. As a teacher, you carry on a tradition that descends directly from Beethoven himself, handed down generationally through Karl Czerny, Theodor Leschetetsky, and Arthur Schnabel, to and through you. Your students love studying with you, saying you take them beyond piano and beyond music, and invest yourself completely with great thought and care in each student. In the mid-1990s, you regained use of your right hand, leading to an extraordinary career renaissance. You joined forces with your wife, pianist Katherine Jacobson, to form the Fleischer Jacobson duo, giving concerts worldwide and recording for Sony Classical. Your 2004 album, Two Hands, held a top five Billboard chart position and was hailed by critics as one of the best recordings of the year. Two Hands is also the title of the Oscar nominated documentary film about your amazing life story. Your 2010 memoir, My Nine Lives, was followed by a Sony Classical 23 CD box set of your entire recorded output. In 2014, you released your first solo CD in a decade, 
the Grammy nominated all the things you are. The numerous honors you have received in recognition of your accomplishments include the Kennedy Center Honors, Commander in the Order of Arts and Letters from the Minister of Culture of the French Government, membership in the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and honorary doctorates from Juilliard, Johns Hopkins University, the Boston Conservatory, the Cleveland Institute of Music, the San Francisco Conservatory of Music, and the University of Cincinnati. You were inducted into the Classical Music Hall of Fame in the year 2000, the first living pianist to be so honored. Now approaching age 90, in addition to teaching at Peabody, you continue with an international schedule of master classes, performances, and orchestral guest conducting. This year, you return to China and Japan as conductor and soloist and will appear at the Ravinia and Tanglewood festivals. The 2018-19 season will see you appear in Toronto, Ottawa, and Montreal as soloist with the Toronto Symphony at the Gilmore Festival and in recitals at Carnegie Hall and in Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., and San Francisco, among other cities. Leon Fleischer, you are indeed, as the New Yorker has written, a musician of magisterial powers, an artist whose towering legacy is marked by wisdom, humility, and gracious humanity. With this award, we celebrate your profound and lasting impact on Peabody, on music, and on the world. I am proud to bestow on you today the highest honor conferred by the Peabody Institute of the Johns Hopkins University, the George Peabody Medal for Outstanding Contributions to Music in America. Einstein, distinguished colleagues, distinguished guests, families, and students. I feel very awkward here <laughs> because I really want to talk to students, and I realize that there are a lot of them behind me. <laughs> I'll have to talk to powers that be. We have to arrange it somehow. <laughs> uh, it strikes me that not that much time has passed since I was first told about 80 odd years ago that I played very well for my age. <laughs> Until last week, when I was told the same thing. <laughs> I would like to address my few words to the young musicians who are graduating. We are a society that uh, celebrates stars. And one of the ways we do that is by uh, what you might call marketing by using middlemen to help
create and support our stars. And I just want to say that the only truly indispensable middlemen in our lives are you and you behind me and me. Because until that moment when an audience can enter a hall and instead of being given a program, they would be given a copy of the music and they would carry that music to their seat and they would open that score and read it with the same pleasure as though they would play it. Until that moment arrives, you and you and I are truly indispensable middlemen. Otherwise, they're just dots of ink on a piece of paper. The Hmm, interesting. <laughs> Give me a moment. Uh, the point that I want to make is that in spite of that being indispensable, you and you and I are not the stars of the event. That's a different perspective for you. The star is the music. You and you and I are the vessel, are the channel through which this music is transmitted from the genius of the composer to you, the listener. So that should give you a certain perspective that is both stress relieving <laughs> and on a different level, stress raising. <laughs> because great music, and that's what I'm talking about in Schnabel's terms, great music is that music which is better than can be played. So great music is always ahead of you, like the carrot in front of the donkey. you always have better and more beautiful to go. The other point that I want to make, and this is mostly for myself, as well as for my distinguished and beloved colleagues and you all who are about to embark on lives in music, try not to in your teaching, pass on prejudices that you have learned in music. I think the basic function of a teacher, the most important function of a teacher, is to teach how to learn. What aspects of your art you must consider, take under advice in making your choices and decisions. It's a wonderful life because you can do it at 11.15 a.m. one way and at 11.20 a.m. you can do it another way. 
and there's no penalty involved. I'd like to end with a story that should also give courage to all of you. Once when I was a kid of, in my early 30s, I had the, the pleasure and honor of playing a chamber music concert in my hometown of San Francisco, the War Memorial Opera House. Uh, and my partners in that chamber music concert which included the Brahms C minor quartet and the Schubert E flat, the second piano trio, were some string players by the name of Heifetz, Piatigorsky, and Primrose. <laughs> yeah, they were pretty scary. <laughs> Especially Heifetz, <laughs> with his pale blue eyes his non-smiling, pale blue eyes. <laughs> he was known as a very good ping pong player. So was I. <laughs> and I soon discovered his secret. He didn't play so well, he just didn't sweat. And that intimidated everybody. However, we were backstage in the Blue Room before the concert, and it was one of those Blue Rooms that didn't have a piano. And, you know, in one corner of the room was Heifetz, and the other Primrose, and Piatigorsky, and I just sat there. They were all noodling, warming up. And finally, after about five minutes, I couldn't contain myself any longer. I started to whine. And Piatigorsky, dear, dear, dear man, whose daughter is a friend to many of us here in this room, Jephthah Drachman, uh, he put his cello down on the floor and he came over and he threw his arms around my shoulder. Uh, an enormous man with a deep, Russian voice. And he said, Leonchik, you know, warming up before a concert is like doing breathing exercises before dying. <laughs> Good luck to you all. It's now my honor to introduce our guest speaker for the 136th Peabody Conservatory Commencement, Deborah Rutter. President of the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts, since September 2014, Deborah Rutter is the third person to serve in this capacity and the first female president. One of the most influential arts administrators in the world of classical music, she manages all facets of the Kennedy Center facility, including theater, contemporary dance, ballet, chamber music, and jazz seasons, as well as its affiliates, the National Symphony Orchestra, and the Washington National Opera, and offerings in hip hop, contemporary music, and comedy. The Kennedy Center encompasses one of the nation's largest arts education programs and includes VSA, the International Organization on Arts and Disability, and Turnaround Arts in partnership with the President's Committee on Arts and Humanities. Under Deborah Rutter's vision, the Kennedy Center is reimagining ways of presenting the arts in the 21st century through diversification of audience, community engagement, and interdisciplinary and innovative programming. She has implemented artist-curated programming across many of the Kennedy Center's key genres and as a champion of new music. 
Prior to the Kennedy Center, Deborah Rutter served as president of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra Association, executive director of the Seattle Symphony, executive director of the Los Angeles Chamber Orchestra, and orchestra manager of the Los Angeles Philharmonic. She is a trained violinist and pianist and also holds an MBA from the University of Southern California. Ms. Rutter was last at Peabody in April 2016 when she was featured guest at one of our Dean Symposiums. Please join me in welcoming Deborah Rutter. Good, good morning, Provost Kumar, Dean Friend Bronstein, Maestro Fleischer, good friend, and Maestro Adam, bravo. Um, to the members of the Peabody Institute Advisory Board, the faculty, staff, alumni, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and most importantly, class of 2018, I am the only outsider in this room. <laughs> but thank you for having me. I'd like to start just by saying to the parents and the grandparents, the families and friends, congratulations to you as the wife of a professor of music and the mother of a singer, I know what it has taken for you to be here and to celebrate. So congratulations to all of you. So this time of year is filled with uh, many conversations about graduation and the role of a commencement speaker including one that I only fell upon recently. Um, I confess I was told this by my husband who was at a recent commencement. And the story is of a comment from an unnamed university president to a speaker who was preparing words for this occasion. And the story goes that the president offered this advice. Think of yourself as the body at an Irish wake. They need you in order to have the party, but no one really expects you to say very much. <laughs> or, for that matter, to be remembered. But I will forge ahead, as I do have words, and I care so much about what you are about to go and do. So to you, our graduates, my congratulations for reaching this really impressive milestone in your personal journey as an artist. I know this accomplishment didn't come easily. Years and years, a lifetime in practice rooms, on stages, in dark studios, in rehearsal spaces alone, or in groups toiling away to perfect your art. You are finally here with your colleagues and sometime competitors to celebrate together. For today, you truly are standing on the starting line for the rest of your lives and you likely have more questions than answers at this point. So speaking to you on this occasion is an extraordinary opportunity and also a daunting one for me. How can I adequately reflect on or offer a celebration of your years at Peabody? The tears of joy and anguish, the dedication and di disappointments, and mostly the momentous breakthroughs in your personal development. How can I best inspire you for all that is to come in your future? Who am I but the outsider, an observer, a commentator? Your success belongs to you, but your teachers and peers, your family and friends have helped you get here. And by now you know that learning extends beyond the classroom or the practice room, the studio or stage. It's more than technical achievement or memorization. Successful learning is about hard work, problem solving, collaboration, and creativity. It is about pushing yourself to stretch beyond the comfort zone while stay, staying true to yourself and learning from the feedback, both positive and negative. Creativity requires integrity, courage, and a vision for the future that makes room for possibility that you have not yet exhausted all of your options. The writer James Baldwin um, admonished us to know from whence you came. If you know whence you came, there is absolutely no limitations 
to where you can go. Over a hundred years ago, the grandson of Irish immigrants was born into affluent privilege while being limited physically with serious illness and pain. Rather than taking the easy way, the boy chose to push himself and strive at self-improvement through pain and discomfort, rejecting physical and intellectual laziness his entire life. He learned to express himself in a way many have tried to emulate, but few have come close to matching. His creativity and ability with words led him to, led him to write a best-selling book while still an undergraduate. He demonstrated that service is at the heart of what it means to be an American and volunteered for combat duty during his generation's war and then entered public service for the balance of his life. So you no doubt have figured out that I'm speaking of President John F. Kennedy, for whom our National Cultural Center is named. He is one of our most cherished of presidents because of what he stood for and for his eloquence in speaking of the importance of artists in our society. Our elected officials are mostly remembered for their decisions and actions. And while that is also true for JFK, we also remember how he used language to ask important questions and convey his optimism and ideals for the future. We quote JFK all the time at the Kennedy Center, and I'll try and limit it today. But here's one that I believe is really appropriate. He said, creativity is the hardest work there is. To me, that means never shy away from an idea because it's new, or don't own it too fervently just because it's your own. Creativity is a value that sets up successful outcomes, be it in the arts or in any other field that requires more than the norm to succeed. Now it is your time to think about how creativity can take you forward, as Baldwin said, with no limitations. Not just as an artist, but how you share your art and how you impact the world around you. President Kennedy challenged his generation to put a man on the moon and return him safely to Earth within a decade. We choose to go to the moon and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Creativity was the only value that could match the daring and audacity of JFK's moonshot challenge. What if I were to tell you there are no limits on what you can do? What if I told you that by embracing your inner creativity, you stand the best chance of tackling the greatest challenges on your path ahead, be they personal or professional pursuits? Harnessing creativity is your inner superpower and probably the most important one. Creativity propels your imagination, innovation, undermines your doubters and skeptics, and prevents each of us from settling for the easy way out. Here I am, speaking to you as graduating artists, all of your family and friends, and the many teachers, artists, and musicians who have traveled this journey with you. Of course you're creative. But this is not the only type of creativity I am speaking of. You are artists. The creativity I am encouraging you to consider now, now is of how you will share your artistry, how you will use your superpower to make the world a better place. I am asking you to be considering new opportunities for your personal creative expression. So here's a little bit of insider information. Believe it or not, the world of working in the performing arts is not really that open to change and innovation. In my ex am I right? <laughs> but in my experience, change and innovation and creativity are central to success and contextual relevance. If for no other reason than to continue to make the arts a powerful force of expression for generations to come, and because the, uniques have, the arts have a unique ability to bring people together as we artists and audiences share an experience. There have been moments throughout my career when people told me an was, idea was too difficult, too far-fetched, really crazy. And most of the time, those reactions just hardened my resolve. 
The difference between being stubborn, I hope and pray, and being driven is significant, but they are not always perceptible. So borrowing from Kennedy again, that is, we must do what is difficult. After many years of exploring new opportunities in the performing arts, I want to convey to you that the fight is worth fighting. Though it's sometimes easier to talk yourself into acquiescence, the difficult and more creative outcomes are worth the journey. My reminder to colleagues is that managing success is far more difficult than managing failure. And I've learned many a time that creativity is the hardest work there is, but it is also the most powerful and rewarding. And that's what brings me here today. My journey through the arts is a path that has taken me to exciting, moving, inspi inspiring, and sometimes scary and sad places. Whether to the Musikverein in Vienna or Suntory Hall in Tokyo, an orphanage in St. Petersburg, Russia, or a halfway house for teens in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, the unifying experience is the transformative power of music. While I was at the Chicago Symphony, we were challenged to take the orchestra to all parts of the community, especially to those individuals who don't have any access to the arts. We envisioned taking music and using it to improve the lives of everyone in Chicago. We, in this room, know that the arts are a powerful way of bringing people together and creating community. So I sought out friends and colleagues who shared this idea who didn't believe it was foolish, nonsensical, or impossible to undertake. And together we set upon a course to bring music and theater in the form of opera arias and eventually musical theater into correctional facilities in Chicago. After all, opera is about life, death, crime, redemption. What better place to tell the stories than in prison? The music took root in a female juvenile detention center and evolved from entertainment into culture, where we supported the young women as they began to write and perform their own works upon themes so familiar in their own lives. This program was powerful to these young women because it enabled them to tell their personal story while learning to write music and to perform. And they expressed themselves in brand new ways culminating in a performance for each other and their families. An unlikely musical performance by the most unexpected of artists. Was it high art, education, therapy, or a way for all to feel like equals? Is there a difference? Our purpose was the journey more than it was the destination, and it was well worth taking but it wasn't easy. The skeptics were legion, and their skepticism was totally fair. We were taking resources away from conventional programming and placing them in an unproven environment. And even the best case scenario was that we would be bringing music to prisoners. So easy was not anything about that. The work I started there with a program like that with Yo-Yo Ma and Ricardo Muti and the Chicago Symphony Orchestra in 2006 ultimately led to the creation now of the Kennedy Center's Citizen Artist Fellowship. As we now enter its fourth year, we have 21 artists across the various art forms throughout the country using those superpowers as creative individuals, touching lives, changing worlds, inspiring those who deserve to have a new perspective on life. Beyond those 21 that we have recognized, I know there are many, many more who are doing this work in communities large and small. There's Vijay Gupta of the Los Angeles Philharmonic, making music with homeless men and women with street symphony, building self-esteem and a sense of purpose to a community of individuals who normally feel hopeless and invisible. Or C.J. Phillip, who created and leads Dance and Be More here in Baltimore. It's a community-based dance program for seniors and families addressing loneliness, healing, and self-worth. Or Shaw Pong, a Boston-based violinist whose current project, Code Listen, uses music to support healing and dialogue around gun violence, racism, and police practices 
in collaboration with the Boston Police Department, local musicians, teen artists, and family members surviving homicide. These artists are all trained at the very highest levels of excellence, just like you. And while they also perform on that standard level of excellence, they are also sharing their superpowers to make their worlds better, healthier, and safer. President Kennedy's words ring true throughout the Citizen Artist Initiative. We challenge ourselves to think creatively and do what is difficult because it is important. I believe in these words and his challenge, and I think about that every day. This sentiment was invoked at the Kennedy Center a couple of years ago when we determined it was time to bring hip hop to the main stage of the Kennedy Center. Not just for one night or a special event, we'd already done that, but rather as a regular part of our ongoing program on into the future. Especially in this room, you probably can imagine that this did not resonate so well with those who think that opera and symphonic music, chamber music, jazz, or other more established art forms other than hip hop should be central at the Kennedy Center. But it was time. Hip hop culture matters, it has a long history, and there is an important story that deserves to be told at the National Cultural Center. To place it in our programming mix just, believe, just required that we believe in it, that we take the time and the resources to plow forward and carry everyone along with the idea. And some of the greatest fun I have had in the last season was witnessing the creative sparks generated by Q-Tip and Jason Moran as they found resonance and inspiration in sharing and blending rap and jazz music. I'm, a grow, I'm very, very aware of a growing trend for pessimism. It seems pervasive in our national conversation. But I look to you, our artists of today and the future, as I believe you offer us a perspective that no others can. You are our natural leaders. There is no way of predicting what may happen as long as you have the courage and creativity to explore possibilities give generously of yourself, and refuse to be defined solely by the narrow margins of your art and art form. Your options are only limited by your own diligence, tenacity, and focus. Yes, there are obstacles, but you have already proven that you have the talent and the tools to change your own life and master your own challenges. By not backing away from a daunting idea, by working together and embrace creative thinking, now is your opportunity to share your talent and your skills to help us the, make the world a better place. So today I call on you not to back down from a problem or project just because it seems difficult. Don't take the easy way out. Be true to who you are. You are artists with your own unique talents and perspective. You are the creators who hold a mirror up to the world, and now that you have mastered your technique, you must deploy it. There are no limit limits to what you can do, no frontiers you cannot explore, and you may even be creating new frontiers. 100 years ago, women could not vote, and now women represent both political parties and legislative bodies around the country and just south of here. 100 years from now, ideas that seem absurd or unworkable now will be commonplace. So how are you going to spend your time, your talents, your art? On the forward edge of creative problem solving or on the sideline, content to watch others make the changes that accompany every generation's opportunities and challenge. I urge the former for the sake of all of us here who share this planet. What will your moonshot be? So welcome to life as an artist, a citizen artist. Good luck. Thank you.
is my pleasure to announce that Dr. Townsend Plant, Associate Dean for Enrollment and Student Life, will present the recipients of the degree of Bachelor of Music, the Graduate Performance Diploma, the degree of Master of Arts, and the degree of Master of Music, the Artist Diploma, and the degree of Doctor of Musical Arts to the Dean of the Peabody Institute, Dr. Fred Bronstein, and the Provost of the Johns Hopkins University, Dr. Sunil Kumar. The audience is requested to refrain from applauding until after the last diploma in each category has been awarded. The recipients of the Bachelor of Music, please rise. <laughs> Dean Bronstein and Provost Kumar, I have the honor of presenting to you the recipients of the degree Bachelor of Music. Clifton Joseph Guidry III, the soon. Andrew M. Clarinet. Scott Allen Johnson, Jr., Clarinet. Juan Esteban Camilo Martinez, Clarinet. Sing Hyun Ryu, clarinet. Jackson Willis, clarinet. Winfield Bankard Carson V, composition. Jun An Chu, composition. Tianren Long, composition. Terrence Martin, composition. Nicholas Saya, composition. Alec Kipnis, double bass. James Hamilton Peterson, double bass. Yuri Kim, flute. Sean David Stellman, guitar. Christopher Lawrence Frick, horn. Rachel Christina Jones, horn. Kayan Etiel Scanterbury, jazz percussion. Damien Robert Noble, jazz piano. Donald Leo Toker III, jazz piano. Eric Angler, jazz trumpet. Gabriella Alberico, oboe. Gabriella is also receiving a Bachelor of Music in Music Education. Hannah Elizabeth Stoning, oboe. Hannah is also receiving a Bachelor of Music in Music Education. Marie Takeda, percussion. Hyunsu Choi, piano. Cynthia Sun, piano. Ju Ying Wei, piano. Anastasia Kupsas, saxophone. Samuel Hughes, trumpet. 
Joshua Oliru, trumpet. Joshua is also receiving a Bachelor of Music in Music Education. Brandon Skloot, trumpet. Ryan Andrew Yakos, trumpet. Osi Atikpo, tuba. Bronwyn Cure, viola. Benjamin Joseph Hurtnagel, Piera, violin. Rebecca Rose Kasdan, violin. Maitre Miraliharan, violin. <laughs> Flavia Arena Paharo Vandestad, violin. Viola Tom, violin. Madison Van de Wettering, violin. <laughs> Suhyun Han, cello. Han Liu, cello. Joseph Hensler Staten, cello. Jacob Meyer Bowman, Voice. Sarah Marie Buggy, Voice. Mercy Ann Calhoun, Voice. Yunlang Chen, Voice. Casey Rell Swinner Foy, Voice. Shramila Dar, voice. Robert Ellsworth Fong, voice. Tammy Lee, voice. Esther Yeon Tian, voice. With the recipients. Recipients of the Graduate Performance Diploma, please rise. Dean Bronstein, Provost Kumar, I have the honor of presenting to you the recipients of the Graduate Performance Diploma. Melissa Johnson Lander, Chamber Music. Sarah Elizabeth Lynn, Early Music Baroque Flute. Guillerme Andreas, flute. <laughs> Mi Yong Ju, voice. Sanja Maria Kaler, organ. Hyun <laughs> Jung An, piano. <laughs> Dietl Bish, piano. Sine Kang, piano. Julia Maria Dober, cello. Dale Choi, organ. Jason Berger, voice. Kang Jingjing Kui, voice. Noel Therese McMurtry, voice. <laughs> Yan Kiao, violin.
Will the recipients of the degree Master of Arts please rise? Dean Bronstein and Provost Kumar, I have the honor of presenting to you the recipients of the degree Master of Arts. Alex Bradley Carlson. <laughs> Audio Sciences. Alex is also receiving a Bachelor of Music in Recording Arts and Science. <laughs> Jiaxi Ping, Audio Sciences. <laughs> Nan Gao, Audio Sciences. Juan Carlos David Martinez Martinez, Audio Sciences. Juan Carlos is also receiving a Bachelor of Music in Clarinet and a Bachelor of Music in Recording Arts and Science. Martin Phoenix Nunley II, Audio Sciences. Caitlin Grace Wagner, Audio Sciences. <laughs> Would the recipients of the Master of Music please rise? Dean Bronstein and Provost Kumar, I have the honor of presenting to you the recipients of the degree Master of Music. Charles Henry Oler, bass trombone. Scott Edward Ullman, horn. Gabrielle Luciano Carson, trombone. Shinchi Dong, bassoon. <laughs> Quinn Emery's Brown, composition. <laughs> Stephen Matthew Crino, composition. <laughs> Richard Bradford Drehoff, Jr., composition. <laughs> Richard is also receiving a Master of Music in Music Theory Pedagogy. Lita Fink, composition. Lita is also receiving a Master of Music in Violin. Jamie Ledwinger, composition. Haley Elizabeth Olson, composition. Yuting Tong, composition. Yuting is also receiving a Master of Music in Music Theory Pedagogy. Martin Walters, composition. Yan Huang, computer music, composition. Samuel Lawrence Edelman Torres, computer music composition. Maria Paula Avila Martinez, conducting. Yeji Jung, conducting. <laughs> Jisoo Kim, conducting. <laughs> Douglas Noboru Ohashi, double bass. <laughs> Gabriel Ryu, double bass. <laughs> Brandon Samuel Smith, double bass. Jianzi Zhang, double bass. John Taylor Mitchell, early music Baroque flute. Nathan Peter Cicero, ensemble arts vocal company. Mira Su, ensemble arts vocal company. 
Abin Malhotra, Euphonium. Abin is also receiving a Master of Music in Wind Conducting. Aaron Civic, Guitar. Aaron Evelyn Baker, Harp and Pedagogy. Bailey Joy Myers, Horn. Sarah Ashley Fabian, Music Education. Nizia Olga Matterwitz, Music Education. <laughs> William Scott, Music Education. Adam Richard Stevens, Music Education. Samuel Michael York, Oboe. <laughs> Hyungmin Kim, Organ. Ujin Kim, Organ. Mi Chu, Organ. Russell Jordan Fisher, Percussion. Nonoka Mizukami, Percussion. Yesil Cho, Piano. Victoria Chung, Piano. Chelsea D'Souza, Piano. Allison Freeman, Piano. Yumi Zhang, Piano. Ting An Lai, Piano. Bo Chan Li, Piano. Jia Wei Liao, Piano. Ching Yi Lin, Piano. Rikeko Tumura, Piano. Tao Tao, Piano. Anchi Wong, Piano. Shi Yu Wong, Piano. Shine Huang, Piano and Pedagogy. Su Jong Ao, Piano and Pedagogy. Taeho Huang, Saxophone. Kyle Blake Jones, Saxophone. Benjamin Paul Larish, saxophone. Benjamin is also receiving a Master of Music in Wind Conducting. Tyrone Germain Page, Jr., saxophone. Tyrone is also receiving a Master of Music in Wind Conducting. Andrew Izell, trumpet. Jennifer Kim, viola. Gavin Peck, viola. Jasper Zientek, viola. Phoebe Hu, viola and pedagogy. Molly Wilkins Reed, viola and pedagogy. Nicholas Bentz, violin. Alexander Hardin, violin. Alexander is also receiving a Master of Music in Musicology. Hyunji Lim, violin. Yetsi Wong, violin. Yu Hong Tu, violin and pedagogy. Robert Douglas Kaufman, cello. Michael Harrison Newman, cello. 
Erica Grace Anderson, voice. Ariana Arnold, voice. Mary Burke, voice. Teresa Ferrara, voice. Amelia Isabel Hill Figuera, voice. Evan Michael Gutierrez, voice. Anki Hay, voice. Madeline Rose Huss, voice. Madeline is also receiving a Master of Music in Music Theory Pedagogy. Tianyu Long, voice. Robin Elizabeth Muse, voice. Lisa Nicole Parente, voice. Catherine Olivia Procell, voice. Aaron Lynn Rogers, voice. Ross Tomaccio, voice. Lauren Marie Vandenbroek, voice. Hannah Marie Wardell, voice. Chong Wu Wu, voice. Caitlin Carol Duckworth, voice and pedagogy. Simone Adaris Harcum, voice and pedagogy. Jennifer Ann Mayer, voice and pedagogy. Wei Shen Keen Ong, voice and pedagogy. Yeah. Rachel Sandler, voice and pedagogy. Yeah. Christy Day Spicer, voice and pedagogy. of the Artist Diploma, please rise. <laughs> Dean Bronstein and Provost Kumar, I have the honor of presenting to you the recipients of the Artist Diploma. Mansu, guitar. <laughs> Silky Yu, piano. Recipients of the Doctor of Musical Arts, please rise. Dean Bronstein and Provost Kumar, I have the honor of presenting to you the recipients of the degree Doctor of Musical Arts. Nathan Wilson Ball, composition. Paul McShee, conducting. Nathaniel Benjamin Cornelius, guitar. Nathaniel is also receiving a Master of Music in Music Theory Pedagogy. <laughs> Hee-Seong Huang, piano. <laughs> Eric Zuber, piano.
Sarah Lowenstein, viola. Let me just begin with a, a bit of housekeeping. Uh, I want to invite everyone to please join us on the plaza immediately following the conclusion of today's graduation ceremony. And I want to again congratulate all of our graduates, all of you today, on your many, many impressive accomplishments. And you've worked really hard, suffered setbacks, triumphed, and done things you once thought impossible. Now, as a first order of business, I'm going to invite you all to stand up. All graduates right now, stand up. Come on, up. Turn around. And I want you to thank all of your family and friends who have been there with you each step of the way. Big round of applause. So, um, yeah, you can sit down. <laughs> so you, you, you all enter um, the world today as young adults and professionals at both an exciting and daunting time. It's impossible to look around at the world and not come to the conclusion that we're in a time of unprecedented change and evolution. This is true of many fields, music included, as well as many aspects of our culture. For all of us engaged with the arts institutions, it's incumbent upon us to not just navigate, but set the pace for and lead that change. This, after all, has been the hallmark of the arts, to challenge, question, and find new ways of seeing the world. So what is Peabody's role in this change? As the oldest conservatory in the United States today, and as a division of one of the world's great universities, Johns Hopkins, the Peabody Institute has an especially important role to play in leading change in the field of music. It is the reason that this past fall, Peabody launched a unique approach to training 21st century musicians. The Breakthrough Curriculum puts a stake in the ground around this issue by saying that it is no longer enough to be an outstanding musician and performer, although we know that is paramount. But in today's world, one must be a good communicator, an effective programmer, and a citizen artist in every sense. Embrace it or not, today we are all in the audience development business. Similarly, in another first, the Johns Hopkins Rehabilitation Network Clinic for Performing Artists at the Peabody Institute opened on our campus in April, a major step forward in serving injury prevention needs of our students and other members of the wider musical community, and in doing so, putting front and center an issue that has damaged too many careers. Peabody has also chosen to put a stake in the ground around the issue of diversity and inclusion. It is no secret that the world of classical music has been largely devoid of diversity. Look at symphony orchestras. Sadly, they look no more diverse today than 25 years ago when orchestras really began to talk in earnest about this challenge. But that's where we come in. Because the discipline of the arts, especially music, requires early access to training. Moving the needle here mandates a commitment by institutions like Peabody to make diversity a core value. We should really ask ourselves in a deep way, why does diversity matter? I see four fundamental reasons. First, it's the right thing to do, and doing the right thing will always be in the interest of the institution. 
Second, as we have seen in business and other enterprises, diversity begets excellence, and we are all about excellence. Third, musical barriers are breaking down. Different genres of music are influencing today's composers and vice versa. Classical music is influencing other voices. In order to foster this fantastic and rich landscape, we benefit from different creative voices in that conversation as performers, composers, and audiences. Apropos this point, it's exciting news that the 2018 Pulitzer Prize in Music went to rapper Kendrick Lamar for his album, Damn. Lamar is the first composer outside the classical or jazz arenas to be awarded a Pulitzer. And one of the critical subtexts of his win is that the message that it sends about how musical boundaries are uncontained. They are breaking down. For too long, we have seen art and music as a function of silos. Pop here, classical over there, jazz somewhere else. You get the idea. It doesn't work anymore. It's artificial which leads to the fourth and perhaps the most important point. Diversity is key to future audience development. If we want to be growing audiences for the future, we need to attract a more diverse audience. This will be even more essential as demographics shift in the coming decades. We need to understand and leverage that shift. And ultimately, we will only truly diversify our audiences if we diversify the performers on our stages. That is quite simply why the focus on diversity and inclusion is not only right, it's also smart and vital for the future of classical music and in the interest of all genres of music. Now, as I've sat back and thought even more about what is underneath all these initiatives, indeed what is underneath the whole notion of being a musician, more than anything it is about listening Yes, it's about doing, but there can be no music without listening. If we're playing in an orchestra, we have to listen. If we're playing chamber music, we have to listen. We have to listen to ourselves, and we have to listen to others. Our whole art form is based on active listening and the exchange of ideas through listening. So when we talk about the 21st century musician and skills necessary to not just make art, but to make art relevant, it's about more than community engagement. It's about active listening. It's about, as Eric Booth would say, and I'm paraphrasing, it's about engaging in dialogue with our potential audience, listening to the framework of their lives, and trying to figure out how we can add value in a meaningful, substantive, and relevant way through dialogue and understanding. In many ways, the aspirations around diversity and inclusion pose the same question. Are we listening? Are we really listening? Can we hear things the way others do? We live in a time when it's tempting not to listen. The politics, the level of discourse, the inability to distinguish fact from fiction, or worse, the lack of caring about that distinction. What we do has the ability to cut through all that with music. Anyone who has ever made music knows there is no lying. There is no deceit there. Performance and art reveal truth and vulnerability. So it occurs to me that here we are, a community of musicians, a world unto ourselves, and we have all the challenges of the larger world. We have relationships. We have people with voices and those who are struggling to be heard. We have people we feel in sync with, others with whom we do not. And from time to time, civility is challenged. But it also occurs to me that we have a huge advantage. We're a community of listeners, active listeners. We're listening as musicians to each other. We're listening to the outside world as to how we can be of service. So perhaps we can improve on our own experiment here, our own ability to listen, and be a model for others in this area in much the same way we're modeling new modes of training. There's a lot of passion on this campus. It mostly gets channeled positively and productively.
But maybe we can all do a little better. Maybe we can all listen a little better to each other as musicians, people, and colleagues. That doesn't mean nirvana. It doesn't mean we'll always agree. It just means we listened. We listened a little more and in the process made this an even better place. Thank you. Congratulations again to the class of 2018. Well done. Guys.